The Philippines. Beyond its beaches and rich culture, here, people are digitally adept and early adopters of new innovations. This is all supported by world-class digital infrastructure. Here, across its more than 7,000 islands, making it the ideal digital market destination. The Philippines. IPv4.Global, from Hilco Stream Bank. Backed by Hilco Global, IPv4.Global has completed thousands of transfers. Our online marketplace serves address blocks and ASNs of all sizes and regions. Transparent, experienced, reliable. IPv4.Global. You don't call your mum via a chain of other people's phones. So why would your Australian network be any different? One Internet Exchange Service makes single-point national connectivity in the Australian market as simple as IAA. Carrier-neutral, high-performance, unmetered peering from IAA. Because your users deserve it. In Asia, the IP address management is managed by an organisation called APNIC. Then, APNIC appointed IDNIC, APG, to run the IP address management process, especially in Indonesia. Cymru delivers no-cost threat monitoring to internet service providers and hosting providers who partner with us. Nimbus Threat Monitor gives you near real-time threat detection, illuminating the compromised assets on your network and those of your clients by correlating your network flows with our world-class IP reputation data. Saving and improving lives is Team Cymru's mission, and making the internet a safer place is integral to that mission. Take advantage of our peer signal threat detection today.
right, welcome back everyone. Um, just two sessions of Apricot 2022 are left. And let me just start the record. And so I'd like to welcome you to the next session, the security operations session, which is chaired by Masataka Mavatari. Masataka, the session is yours. Thank you for introduction. So, uh, uh... I'm uh, one of the uh, co-session moderators with Tashi of this uh, Evercoat Security Operations Program. My name is Masataka Maratari from JPIX. So uh, we have three sessions during this time short for one hour, uh, just one hour. So uh, I would like to go ahead with the presentation smoothly. So uh, each three speaker has 18 minutes for presentation and two minutes for discussion and Q&A time. Uh, please to keep that time. And first of all, uh, first presentation is a transparent forwarder, uh, an unnoticed component of the OpenDNS infrastructure. Uh, speaker is machine. So could you please prepare your presentation? Absolutely, hello everyone. Uh, just let me share my screen, please. Looks right. good. Looks good, okay, nice. Okay, so um, hi all, I'm Marcin and welcome to my talk about an open but hidden or maybe unnoticed part of the DNS infrastructure. And this is joint work with Mayna, Thomas and Matthias. We are actually from academia. So, um, in a nutshell, we ask whether common DNS scanning methods detect all relevant parts of the open DNS ecosystem. And we actually think that this is not the case. So, we found that a quarter of the open DNS ecosystem consists of a component that we call transparent forwarders. And in this talk, we will explain what transparent forwarders are and why it is important to observe them. So let's quickly clarify the terms here that we use. So open DNS are client-side DNS components such as recursive resolvers, which react to requests openly. So they react to requests from any source and answer them. And we care about them because they lead to the problem of reflective amplification attacks. So, um, during such amplification attacks, attackers spoof the IP address of the victim, and then the amplified responses reach the victim. And that's why our community performs regular scans, and um, we try to find and remove as many uh, open DNS as we can. Overall, this presentation is based on our paper where we make the following contributions. We compare and discuss different DNS scanning methods and use one of them to detect and analyze transparent forwarders. We also introduce a tool which we call DNS route, which allows to explore these uh, transparent forwarders and the infrastructure around them. And as a last step, we assess the impact on the attack surface. Today, during this talk, I will focus on the following contributions, um, but please see our paper for all the nice details we just asked during the Q&A session. So, all right, let's take a look at um, how transparent forwarders work and why they are potentially missed by scans. So transparent forwarders are devices that react to DNS scanners in a very special way. So we have the transparent forwarder here. And then in this example, we have an internet-wide internet DNS scanner that sends DNS requests to, um, to the whole IPv4 space and also in this case, the transparent forwarder. And obviously the scanner uses a specific client source port. And since this is a well-structured DNS request, we have all the DNS fields like the query name, but it's also shown here the DNS transaction ID and so on. And now comes the most critical part. While receiving the request, the transparent forwarder actually rewrites the destination IP address, but keeps all the other fields. So this means that the forwarder actually spoofs the IP address of the scanner and then forwards the DNS request to the public resolver. And now what happens is, of course, that the resolver will try to resolve the query and then sends the response directly to the scanner. So the resolver here behaves correctly, uh, because uh, the resolver thinks that the packet came directly from the scanner, but it actually came from the DNS uh, transparent forward. 
So let me sum up here. First, transparent forwarders send spoof packets. And second, scanners that consider only the replying source IP address have an incomplete picture. And this is because transparent forwarders react um, openly to DNS requests, but their IP address are not part of the final DNS response. So again, please note that the public resolver never sees the IP address of the transparent forwarder. And so we have to, in order to have a complete picture, we have to somehow correlate requests and responses. That's the only way uh, to detect transparent forwarders. And let me briefly put this all this into context. Um, there are well-known DNS manipulations such as transparent interception or redirection, but uh, we actually show in the paper that these are not responsible for the observed effects here. And in fact, transparent forwarders have been described by George Mark many years ago. However, they fell off the radar as an exception. And this is why popular scanning campaigns do not cover transparent forwarders currently. Overall, other scanning campaigns report currently below 2 million ODNS. And our scans detect slightly more because we include transparent forwards. And in the paper, we additionally conduct a controlled experiment with honeypots to prove that scanning campaigns indeed miss them. Um, but overall, in the last eight years, the absolute number of all other ODNS components actually decreased from 20 million to now below 2 million. So the thing is, that the absolute number of transparent forwarders remained stable. So this is why transparent forwarders transitioned from an exception to actually a major part of the ODNS ecosystem. They now account for 26% of all ODNSs. And that's why we investigated and started to analyze them. So Again, if you still ask yourself why transparent forwarders are not detected, well, it's basically because of efficiency reasons. Um, most scanning campaigns just use a static query and only evaluate the incoming traffic. That's the fastest way to perform uh, internet-wide DNS scans. And this, of course, means that the scanning campaigns only see the replying source address, which is the address of the resolver. And um, the address of the transparent folder remains hidden to them. So we, on the other hand, use a quite simple way to detect transparent folders. First of all, we re record the outgoing and the incoming traffic. That's the first thing we do. And for all our requests, we use random source ports and DNS transaction IDs, which we then use to match requests and responses. And um, Note that we do not match using the IP address. So even if we receive an answer from a different IP address, we are still able to infer the original address uh, which received the request. And this is usually, uh, in many cases, the IP address of the transparent forward. And all this can be done quite efficiently during post, post analysis especially, and has minimal impact on the scans themselves. So that's why we use this way. Now let's take a look at the results. So the first question you might ask is in which countries are transparent forwarders deployed? And we show this in this graph. On the y-axis, we show the number of transparent forwarders. Please note that this is logarithmic. And the x-axis is a little bit more complicated, but clearly we have here the country code, then we highlight countries, which are classified as an emerging market with a bold star. And we also have a number there, and um, the number shows the number of different autonomous systems which contain transparent forwards in the specific country. So we learned two things here. First, countries classified as emerging markets are more likely to host transparent forwarders. And in each country, multiple ASs host forwarders. We now extend this plot by show showing the relative number of transparent forwarders in each country. So we show this on the right y-axis. And so for example, the ODNS, in Brazil consists of more than 80% of transparent forwarders. So there's a third thing to learn here. In some countries, the ODNS consists almost exclusively of transparent forwarders. 
As a second analysis, let's take a look at which resolvers are used by these transparent forwarders. So this plot is the exactly same x-axis as the plot before, but it shows the share of responses from well-known resolver projects. So these are the public resolvers that most of us know. Um, so if we look at the second country here, for example, India, we see that almost 100% of the Indian transparent forwarders forward to Google. And this consolidation is actually the reason why you receive about 300,000 responses from Google if you perform an internet-wide single packet scan. So to, to conclude here, in some countries, we observe a significant DNS consolidation or uh, centralization for transparent forwarders. And these consolidation trends are actually also true for other ODNS types, as has been recently shown by um, Geoff Houston and others. As the last part of this talk, um, we found that transparent forests can also be used as DNS vantage points. Again, the basis for this is that they only rewrite the IP destination address and keep all the other header values. And based on that, we developed yet another trace route tool, which we call DNS route. Let's take a look. So exactly like the common DNS trace route tool, we send packets and increment the time to live step by step. And this allows us to map the path between our scanner and the transparent forwarder. Um, that's the trace route we all know. But that's where the similarities to trace route end. We actually use real DNS scaries for that. So this means that the transparent forwarder will forward our packets with the low TTL. Also, our implementation does not stop incrementing the TTL when the original target is reached. So this allows us to map the path beyond the transparent forwarder. And since this is, we send DNS scaries as the last part, step of this path, we actually receive a DNS response from the related public result. So the tool uh, DNS route confirms that transparent forwarders indeed spoof the source address and only rewrite the destination address. Otherwise, this tool wouldn't work for us. And second, this also allows us to use transparent forwarders to measure path lengths uh, from the transparent forwarder to the public resolver. So the right part of the path that you just see here. And um, we did this for public and ECAS resolvers. Let's take a look. So um, let me show you a CDF of path lengths from transparent forwarders to the public resolvers. That's the, again, the right part of the path. And um, we differentiate here by three large public resolvers, which are known to utilize AnyCast deployments. Again, redirecting our traffic over transparent forwarders, we are actually able to reach multiple pops. We did not use every path in this measurement because uh, we also observed trace route anomalies. However, we were still able to utilize around 70,000 paths. And as you can see, uh, Cloudflare's AnyCast deployment actually performs best, uh, at least in our measurements. So the final question here would be, what kind of devices are transparent forwarders? Who profits from the behavior and who produces transparent forwarders? And this is a question that we are still not able to answer completely. Um, we used fingerprinting methods and identified a couple of microtech devices. Also, we found a misconfigured Cisco device while communicating with an operator, but that was just a single case. Um, in many cases, we see hints of CPE devices in ISP networks, but um, actually one of the main reasons of my talk today is to get in touch with more operators and maybe to find more details about these devices. Um, so we perform weekly DNS scans and publish them on our website. And um, we also include the top 50 AS ranking with transparent forwarders. So if your autonomous system is in this list, or even if you only have a couple of transparent forwarders in your network, please get in touch with us. Any help is greatly appreciated, um, especially because one of the current findings of our regular scans is, is that the absolute number of transparent forwarders actually slowly increases. So all this is not only legacy devices, but someone out there really is still actively deploying transparent forwarders. All right, um, let me conclude my talk. Um, the OpenDNS ecosystem includes transparent forwarders. 
However, many popular scanning campaigns tend to miss them. Uh, transparent photos can be leveraged as vantage points, as we did. Um, they are probably CP devices deployed mainly in ISP networks in emerging markets. And uh, finally, um, as we argue not more in detail in our paper, um, they could also ease, atta ease attacks because they allow to easily reach multiple POPs of the same AnyCast DNS provider. And this might allow to circumvent POP-based DDoS mitigation thresholds. And with that, um, I would like to uh, finish my talk and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Anyone has any question or comment? Okay, so uh, if you have questions, so you can directly email to Martin. So email address is on the title side of this presentation slide. Okay, so you can download this slide from the Epicot website. Okay, so thank you again for your presentation, Martin. Thank you. So, uh, and uh, maybe we will have question time in the last part of this time sort of this program. And uh, let me move on to the next session. So second presentation is uh, Gatekeeper, the first open source DDoS protection system by Chauvin. So yeah. Chauvin. Uh, could you please prepare your presentation? Please okay, sure, ahead. thanks. Yeah. Let me present my slide. Okay, can you okay. see my slide? Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Chao Bing Fu from Google. And uh, today I'm here to present you uh, uh, Gatekeeper, the first open source DDoS protection system. Uh, this, um, so I will present this work on behalf of the uh, Gatekeeper teammates, uh, Michelle Omatadu from Hostnet, and Cody Dusat from uh, Cloudflare, and John Byers from uh, Boston University. So this work was mostly done while Cody and I uh, were at BU. So our group uh, started looking uh, at the, uh, the DDoS, uh, DDoS attack problem uh, in 2015. Back then, from the public sharings, we realized that uh, DDoS attacks had not picked on bandwidth, packet rate, or complexity. And uh, the worst is still ahead of us. So in 2020, we found this uh, image from Google, which shows a clear change uh, in the largest uh, known DDoS attacks in terms of the bits per second, packets per second, and requests per second. So each of those uh, three uh, metrics is growing exponentially year over year. So we think that um, this is a large uh, problem and it is a considerable concern for many of the network operators. So to provide a solution, for different companies uh, to, uh, uh, to defend themselves, we uh, introduced Gatekeeper with three highlighting uh, features. Firstly, uh, Gatekeeper provides unparalleled uh, uh, multi-vector protection uh, by keeping the state for every uh, flow defined as source and the destination IP pair so that Gatekeeper is able to monitor all the flows and uh, keep the filters uh, active all the time. So this is important because a lot of uh, alternative solutions uh, uh, can only do limited uh, filtering due to uh, limited uh, capacity, uh, making them uh, vulnerable to uh, advanced DDoS attacks. So secondly, uh, Gatekeeper is optimized uh, to be scalable and has been deployed by our, by our partners in uh, production environments. Now, Gatekeeper is serving a uh, uh, production traffic ranging from uh, 10 gigabits per second to one terabits per second. Uh, finally, uh, Gatekeeper uh, can mitigate DDoS attacks in seconds. This is also important because um, 
most of the uh, DDoS attacks on the internet last, uh, last less than four minutes. And there is not much time for human intervention to identify the DDoS attacks first and then to deploy the right uh, uh, DDoS mitigation solutions. Okay, now we have a brief view of uh, why we are working on uh, GitKeeper and what the important features that GitKeeper provides. So let's dive into the GitKeeper architecture and uh, see how it works in more detail. Okay, this slide shows the, uh, the first main components of GitKeeper, the vantage points. So vantage points are the well-provisioned and the geographically uh, distributed uh, points ideally, but not required across the planet as shown uh, uh, here. So these event points have four different requirements. The first requirement is that they need some uh, kind of uh, computing capacity uh, like uh, bandwidth uh, servers or uh, virtual machines um, so that uh, they can run the, uh, the DDoS mitigation uh, software. The second requirement is that they need a uh, cheap ingress bandwidth so that the deployers uh, can mitigate the DDoS attacks affordably. Otherwise, uh, the attackers can easily uh, increase the price of your uh, mitigation. The, uh, the third uh, requirement is uh, BGP peering. GitKeeper relies on it to uh, create an NCAST network so that the client traffic is always forwarded to the nearest vantage point. Uh, instead of directly to the uh, protected destination uh, network. Finally, all the links between the vantage points and uh, the protected destination AS should be private in some way. Otherwise, these links um, are vulnerable to those attacks themselves. So here, we advocate for leveraging the existing uh, infrastructure uh, to do the DDoS mitigation and lower the cost. And some of the examples are the uh, internet exchange, uh, peering links, uh, points of presence, and uh, some uh, cloud providers. Okay, to uh, deploy GitKeeper, uh, there will be a physical presence of uh, uh, GitKeeper components in each of the vantage points. This would require deploying a GitKeeper server that is connected to the switch of an XP. So once the GitKeeper server is connected, then it will uh, announce the routes to the protected destination AS. So when a client uh, tries to connect or does send any traffic uh, to the uh, protected de destination AS, the traffic will be uh, routed to the, uh, the uh, closest venture point. And that's where the traffic is first handled by um, uh, GitKeeper. Okay. Here, uh, we show three uh, GitKeeper servers in this example, and uh, the client traffic will be uh, load balanced among the, uh, the GitKeeper servers using ECMP. And the main responsibilities of the GitKeeper servers are to enforce the upstream uh, policies so that the GitKeeper tries to mitigate the DDoS attacks as close to the source of the traffic as possible. And this, uh, those responsibilities uh, include forwarding the request for the uh, new flows. Basically, those requests ask for permission to uh, trans uh, transmit packets to the destination AES. The GitKeeper servers also uh, keep track of the uh, decisions about whether to allow a flow or not, and drop or read limit its traffic accordingly. So the decisions come in the form of uh, BPF programs. So each flow is assigned to a BPF program and some small amount of uh, state, about 64 bytes. With that state and the BPF program, we get uh, flexible uh, policies and the software. So if the gatekeeper um, server determines that the packets of flow uh, are allowed to uh, transmit uh, to the uh, protected destination AS, then it will uh, transmit the packets at the uh, established rate limit and encapsulate uh, them along this path. So when the package uh, reaches uh, the, um, the dense destination, yes, uh, they will uh, first be uh, 
processed by a uh, Grantor server, which is complementary to a uh, uh, Gatekeeper server. And uh, uh, the Grantor servers are the centralized place uh, to make the policy decisions for each request. So the responsibilities of the Grantor servers uh, include making the policy decisions about uh, the new uh, the request for the new flows and installing those decisions at the uh, Gatekeeper uh, servers as well as decapsulating the packets that are encapsulated by the GitKeeper servers and uh, sending them to their uh, ultimate um, destination server. Note that the policies uh, as the uh, grant, uh, grant servers are written in Lua, which is flexible enough uh, to allow per flow policies. Okay, uh, to uh, quickly uh, summarize uh, how GitKeeper works, so uh, the packets from the clients are uh, for, uh, first forwarded to the uh, closest vantage points. And we have GitKeeper servers in each of the vantage points uh, to uh, enforce the upstream policies. By forwarding the packets of the new flows to the grant servers and uh, to run the uh, BPF program to decide what to do for the established uh, flows. Grant servers run a policy to map flows to BPF programs for uh, for each uh, uh, request for it, uh, a new flow, and forward the uh, the granted package to the destinations. So whenever grant servers make a policy decision about um, about a request for a new flow, they will notify the GitKeeper servers of all the policy decisions, and then the GitKeeper servers will enforce the uh, policy decisions. So the key uh, for the GitKeeper deployments is the accuracy and the definition of those uh, policies. So in the following slide, uh, we will focus on how to write a destination uh, policy for your network. So the first step uh, in writing policies for your own GitKeeper deployments is to identify all your network profiles that you have. Uh, a network profile may apply to a single server, a group of servers, or to a block of IP addresses. So before writing the uh, network profile, you could start to think what are the, uh, the characteristics of, of the uh, profile and how you can define them. So for example, assume that you are writing a network profile for outgoing email servers. For those servers, uh, there should be no uh, listening sockets that should be exposed to the outside world. And there should be a very small ingress traffic footprints. Uh, from those high level descri descriptions, you can start to put together uh, what are the ports that should be allowed for those servers and uh, what's, uh, what's the rate limit that should be allowed. You may get that the information from the configuration file of the production servers and or some uh, uh, documentation uh, in your organization. So once you are clear about what the uh, network profiles are, then you can start to uh, uh, write a BPF program for each network profile. Recall that uh, the BPF program are basically the, uh, the software defined uh, policies that run at the uh, gatekeeper servers. We recommend that um, for each of those uh, BPF programs, uh, classify the package into one of the following three beans. The first bean is uh, uh, the primary, primary bean uh, that has a baseline rate limit applied to it. And this represents the package that serves the main purpose of the service. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the uh, primary bean, we also recommend having a secondary bean for those packages that are needed for the service to operate. For example, uh, the TCP same packets uh, for the uh, connection establishment and the SMP packets for, um, for the network issue diagnosis. So however, uh, the, uh, this bin uh, shouldn't have the uh, same traffic volume as the primary bin of the service. And this allows a secondary rate limit for those kind of traffic. Finally, there is, uh, uh, there is a bin for unwanted traffic to explicitly uh, drop them. For example, if the service only allows for um, port 80, then any traffic other than that should go to the unwanted traffic. So the primary uh, bandwidth uh, limit should be uh, enforced before the packet uh, classification. 
uh, because that's always uh, your baseline. And the secondary uh, bandwidth limit should be uh, only enforced on the secondary packets after the classification. So we also recommend uh, a negative bandwidth enforcement policy. So in the normal uh, rate limit cases, so whenever a flow runs out of its credits in the current time interval, all of its packets will be dropped until it refills the, uh, the credits uh, in the new time interval. So uh, Gatekeeper allows you to uh, keep track of the, uh, the uh, negative bandwidth uh, in the past, in, uh, past uh, time interval for uh, further punishing the misbehaving flows in the current time interval until the flows back off enough uh, to review uh, the uh, credits to be positive. So after you have uh, defined uh, those BPF programs, then you need to then you need to uh, method flows to your uh, BPF programs at Grantor. Uh, to do that, uh, you can just classify uh, the flows using the uh, destination IP address. Uh, so when uh, the Grantor server receives a, a request for a new flow, it looks at the destination IP address uh, and decides that everything. Uh, inside this example, so that's 25 IP block is for uh, the outgoing email servers. And assign the flows uh, to the BPF program that you have just written in the last step. Note that the current servers uh, run this uh, as part of the uh, uh, lower policy. So beyond the destination IP addresses, you could also classify the source IP uh, addresses. Uh, with this, it allows you to reject bogans of your users, uh, malware, and tune the bandwidth to uh, particular partners, countries, and end users. Or it could uh, return different uh, uh, profiles uh, to different entities like CDNs, uh, crawlers, and offices in your organization. And if you want to manage all your uh, IP ranges at this level of management, we also provide a tool called Drip which is available on uh, GitHub for classifying, uh, merging, and prioritizing the IP ranges. Okay, uh, after knowing the details about the policies in GitKeeper, let's take a look at an example policy against a thin flood. Recall that uh, the GitKeeper server will uh, forward a request for each uh, new flow. There is an automatic uh, request channel in GitKeeper which is out of the scope of this presentation. Uh, during the attack, the request channel will be kept to 5% of the link capacity. Moreover, um, a flow receiving a thin flood uh, is counted under the uh, secondary rate limit, which further limits the thin flood to uh, less than 5% of the uh, primary uh, limit. Note that this limit is set on per uh, flow basis, and it does not make sense to give all the link capacity to a single flow. So finally, uh, while the uh, secondary uh, rate limit bounds the worst case, the negative bandwidth blocks the abusive uh, flows. Okay, this policy uh, can stop the typical infrastructure attacks like uh, thin flood, UDP flood, and SMP floods, as well as uh, uh, amplific amplifications like DNS, NTP, and MemCacheD. Over it can uh, have enforced uh, application patterns for crypto alternatives, VoIP, online games, and the port logging. Finally, it also uh, can stop the advanced attacks like uh, Catch-22 and the Crossfire and the arbitrary combination of the above uh, attacks. Okay, we have uh, evaluated some of the types of the attacks that uh, GitKeeper uh, defends against in our uh, white papers. However, due to uh, time limits, we cannot cover uh, them in this talk. And for more details, please uh, see our publications page. Okay, finally, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the planned release of GitKeeper and uh, conclude this talk. So the latest uh, stable version of GitKeeper is uh, 1.0, which was uh, released on uh, last September and is currently being deployed by uh, Diderati and Mail.ru. 
and more uh, uh, improvements are expected to come up soon in version 1.1 and 1.2, uh, which aim to uh, address the production demands uh, from the, uh, the pioneer uh, deployers. So the uh, load balancing in policy is uh, also a plan for version 2.0. Okay, to uh, wrap up this talk, uh, GitKeeper provides unparalleled multi-vector protection and can mitigate DDoS attacks in seconds, and the added latency uh, is small, uh, less than uh, 10 microseconds. Uh, GitKeeper is uh, scalable, open source, and ready for your deployment. Uh, specifically, uh, the uh, policy uh, templates uh, presented here was motivated by the uh, Pioneer deployers. A deployer can create a rather uh, different policies since uh, the policies are basically the uh, BFF programs and uh, lower scripts. Uh, finally, uh, load balancing and the more install for the future. Okay, uh, that's all for my talk and thanks for your time. And yeah, happy to, uh, I'm happy, happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you for great talk. Great gatekeeper. So we have one question on the chat box on this Zoom. Mm -hmm. So question is, uh, let me read, uh, on which network component we could implement this gatekeeper on the top of BGP black holing in router? Yeah, I think uh, the gatekeeper are mainly uh, uh, for the uh, the uh, the servers instead of a, a, a router, and uh, so gatekeeper uh, basically gatekeeper is uh, built on top of, on top of a DPTK. So we should have a, a, a separate server to run the uh, the gatekeeper uh, service. Uh, do I uh, answer your question? So uh, this question is uh, Kangeni from, uh, oh, is it like load balancing? Rob yeah, so, uh, uh, no, currently we uh, do not uh, support load balancing, but in the future we will have the load balancing features as I, uh, I mentioned uh, at the last of the talk. And for now, no, but in the future, yeah, we could implement uh, the uh, load balancing features. Thank you for your answering. So there is further questions from Flo. Mm -hmm. Looks no question. Okay, so uh, is there a way to ask a question for you after this time slot of this session? So is writing question on the issue page of uh, GitHub, okay, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, we have the contest on the GitHub and uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So, uh, and uh, let me move to the next. Uh, thank you. The next is, uh, thank you very much. So Thanks. the final presentation is uh, Ransomware as a Science uh, by Leon. Oh. Hello. Can I hear you? I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, change the view uh, to screen. There we go. Okay, um, it's nice to speak to you. Thanks everyone for um, joining today. Uh, this will be more of a presentation about the economics around ransomware, although not just the economics of how much money the gangs have made. Um, also trying to capture how much we should be spending on defenses and so on. So a little departure from your usual networking towards the economics, but I can assure you um, there are a lot of networks at work in ransomware. 
um, from the command and control servers and the malware to the networks of financial transactions. So um, lots of things for uh, network nerds to get tucked into. Um, so what I, one of the first things I wanna start with is a kind of sectoral analysis of ransomware. Um, this is from a, a fantastic uh, researcher um, known as the ransomware sommelier, um, uh, trying to capture the breakdown of ransomware across all different types of uh, businesses. Um, essentially, what, what I think this shows is that uh, everyone is being hit by ransomware, but it's important to notice that healthcare uh, and government facilities make up a large number of uh, ransomware victims. Um, so that's quite important just in terms of you know who should be protecting themselves from ransomware and and which uh, organizations are getting targeted of course some uh, ransomware gangs and, and threat actors target specific types of infrastructure um, but broadly across all of them you see these kinds of patterns so to give you some sense of the scale of the problem and i, I want to make it clear that we're looking back here uh, a decade of data uh, blockchain ransomware. We know ransomware goes back nearly 30 years to the first um, recorded incident, but the blockchain has been around for a little bit more than a decade, and that allows us to track blockchain payments for an exceptionally long time. Um, and you can see the, the sums by different ransom families on this screen, and this is the amount of money we expect them they may have made uh, over the course of the last decade. Um, Initial access brokers are willing to spend up to 100000 for $100 million companies. Now, initial access brokers, for those of you who haven't worked in the space, are the, the part of the process in the ransomware gang that gets the initial access to the system. Um, and then the ransomware gang will come in, deploy their, decrypt or their encryptor, uh, run it across uh, a network or uh, individual machines, and then do the encryption and then issue the ransom note. So there, these are groups functioning like a business. So if you look at this in a log plot over an extended period of time, it looks something like this. Um, some of the largest ransoms are being paid by corporations. Um, it's quite a disturbing practice in my opinion. Um, so there are some interesting things that we can pick out of this. Uh, you know, first of all, it's been going on at scale for a decade. Um, and secondly, that some of the largest ransoms have been with us for kind of a long time. There's sort of a change, uh, which I'll show you in a slide coming up, between the personalized era of ransomware up until sort of 2014, 2015. That's where individual people's computers were getting infected with ransomware. Um, and then from sort of 2015 onwards, we see the shift towards large corporations are being hit. Um, there's a proliferation of different types of gangs, their tactics change. They start to perform things like uh, double and triple extortion. Um, so to explain what we mean by that kind of double and triple, um, a single uh, extortion would just be, they encrypted all of my files and they're charging me money to, to decrypt them. And the double extortion we refer to is when they um, encrypt all the files. And then if you choose not to pay, they offer to leak all of your data onto the internet. And so you see a lot of these leak sites exist as onion sites uh, these days, announcing the names of victims and sharing their data uh, to prove that they were breached, even when they're not paying the ransom. And this serves as, a, as another leverage on top of um, just the loss of all of your files. Um, people have a tendency to think that it's just the encryption of you know, your cat photos or, or um, meaningless data, but a lot of times it's the configuration of routing equipment, for example, which I think uh, this audience will particularly appreciate. It's difficult to reconstruct in a crisis. Um, so the, the triple extortion refers to that same tactic I just described to you of you know, uh, leaking all your data, but also perhaps uh, a DDoS on your organization's website, again, to uh, triply enforce the idea that you should um, pay the ransom. Sometimes you even see sort of harassment of the C-level executives uh, of the companies as well um, through phone calls or emails or things like this, threatening to personally um, you know, dox them in some way, shape or form. So it's been going on a long time and there's a lot of money involved. That's what I wanted to, uh, the audience to take away from these slides today. Um, so are some families more impactful than others? Absolutely, you can see that from this graph on the log scale, splitting it out by families. Certainly there's more 
incidents associated with some families than with others. Um, that depends a little bit on their kind of infection strategies, if you will. Um, and so that's loosely reflected in this slide. But many of them determine their initial ransom price by looking up details about the victim. Um, so one of the things it's important to understand is, you know, if we're dealing with a, a ransomware gang and, and trying to figure out, you know, what what kind of malware has infected the network and how it's behaving and how it's encrypting things and so on. Um, that's all uh, unknown information for the defenders. But from an attacker's point of view, they know the organization that they've breached. They've probably searched their network to find an insurance policy. They probably know what the limits of that insurance policy are. They certainly know what the annual returning revenue of a company is. Um, so the yearly profits of a company, um, which they can look up in public databases, or you know, if they can find the accounting records, they can estimate. Um, and usually they will use that. Uh, in their negotiations. So a lot of the negotiating arms of these ransomware gangs begin their negotiations at 5% of the annual returning revenue. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more or less, but they sort of feel that it's very likely that, that your organization is willing to pay these amounts. Now, so far I've just spoken to you about how much the ransoms were um, over time. Uh, not necessarily how much the, the loss is to the organization. And so I want to kind of pivot from the amount of money made by the, the threat actors to the amount of money lost by the organizations. These are essentially two different economic processes going on at the same time. Um, I work in the cyber insurance field. One of the jobs for me is putting a price on ransomware. I spent a lot of time on it. And roughly speaking, of all the claims that I've reviewed from other cyber insurance companies, the ransomware, uh, the ransom itself makes up 10 to 40% of a cyber insurance claim. So um, ransomware events can be more expensive after you pay the ransom. Um, there's a lot of boardroom decisions about whether or not you pay the ransom, which is uh, probably too much to go into in this particular session. But what I want to get across to you is that even if you did pay the ransom, you still are dealing with 60% um, more of the incident still to come, right? And that might be PR, that might be regulatory issues, that might be reconfiguring network equipment. Um, even the decryptor that you might get from the gang tends to be very slow and has to be sped up. There are organizations that specialize in ransomware, universal decryptors these days, and they'll take the decryption keys from whatever um, code was given to you by the gang, and they will use the new, the, use the decryption key in a newer, safer uh, decryptor. Now, why you would trust these gangs after they've already compromised you to give you a decryptor, I have no idea, but many people do. And um, Typically what happens is they get the decryptor and they still take weeks to restore their network using the decryptor provided by the gang. So uh, my point here is that even when you pay the ransom, there's still a lot more cost to come. Um, and paying the ransom doesn't necessarily re re result in a cheaper incident um, for many of these things. So how much is the cost of catastrophe for an individual organization? Uh, 10 to 50% of annual returning revenue is how much it would cost you if you were hit by a ransomware event today. Hopefully this helps some of your teams go home and speak to their you know, security ops and say, we should be planning for a ransomware event that hits us as an organization to cost 10 to 50% of our annual returning revenue. One of the things we struggle with with, with ransomware in particular is um, trying to understand the frequency of it. Luckily, working in the insurance business gives um, some insight into those numbers a little bit more than other people might have. Um, so while this is a metric of severity, you know, this is if you had an event, this is how much it would cost your organization. Um, you may be wondering what, what the frequency is. Um, and that is more around 6%. It changes a lot annually, but across all organizations. Of course, the size of your organization, a bunch of other details matter. Um, but we come to that number by looking at the same data that we just looked at to see how much money was made. So a lot of people don't like to talk about old malware, a decade old. I do because it helps me understand how much the frequency could be or, or has been or could be in the future, as, as I just illustrated. Um, so this is breaking down the exact same data that you looked at earlier in a, in a tree graph by the number of victims. And you can see that, you know, these are orders of magnitude different than each other. Um, and this is just the number of paying people per ransom. So when I say victims here, this is the number of ransoms paid. I know that the number of infections is above this. And I'm working on some methods of estimating those number of infections based on the number of ransoms um, or vice versa. And um, that's going reasonably well, but there's still more 
more work to be done in this space, right? Um, in particular, internet scanning is very helpful for us if it detects an infection. A lot of internet scanning doesn't, uh, but when it does, it gives us a sense of the total number of victims, and then we can try and compare that to the number of ransoms paid. So this is based across a corpus of 31,000 Bitcoin addresses that I've collected over the last couple of years. I'm not under the impression that this is complete. I think it's reasonably large. I think it's hopefully more than half of what's going on in the world, but it's difficult to really estimate those numbers at this point in time. But at least uh, of those 31,000 addresses, we have something in the order of 3 million transactions that we believe we're going in and out of uh, ransomware groups, Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash wallets. So our goal um, with the uh, MSR SIG, which I'm just going to introduce here to you, is to discuss uh, whether the problem is getting better or worse and what we can do. So over at first.org, uh, which I think some of your members will know of, um, we have an organization known as the Multi-Stakeholder Ransomware Special Interest Group. And that's where some of this data is coming to you from. I'm one of the co-chairs of that, along with Barry, Ga Barry Green, who I think, again, many of your members may know, and uh, James Chappelle. So how much, uh, how many ransoms are paid? Um, so this is like the frequency studies that I was telling you about. If you take all of that data and you cut it off at the 95% confidence intervals and you break it down by day of the week or you know month of the year or so on, you can get some perspective of the number of ransoms being paid uh, over time. And as you can see, it fluctuates you know, pretty heavily between say 500 and 950 on a Monday with the mean being somewhere around 850. And that's 850 people paying uh, ransoms for ransomware per day over a decade. Um, and you can see clearly in this graph that there are more people paying them uh, during days of the week and Saturday and far fewer people paying them on Sunday. And that's further support of our assessment that things have moved really from personalized ransomware where individual victims get attacked to corporate ransomware where large, large corporations or small corporations uh, are hit by this phenomenon. So from that, we're, we estimate that roughly 6% of companies are hit annually uh, with this kind of problem. So a 6% chance of being hit, and you can expect to lose 10 to 50% of your annual returning revenue in that event. So hopefully that helps some of your risk teams to quantify the impact of ransomware and think about it um, and maybe budget for uh, protecting themselves. That suggests loosely that you should be spending somewhere like 3% of your annual returning revenue on ransomware prevention. Obviously, that's a lot higher than most people are spending um, and may not be tenable for all organizations. But the good thing about some of those expenditures is that they also benefit you in other cases. Backups, for example, um, if you're backing up the configuration of your networks and your credentials and all these sorts of things, that has a, an advantage for your disaster recovery as well. So maybe not all of this needs to be assumed uh, to come directly from a ransomware budgeting perspective. All right. Visualizing that uh, as the number of occurrences per week, you can see some, some change in frequency over here. So have the things that we've been doing over the last uh, 10 years had any effect on reducing some of the frequency? I think you can see that it has. Uh, I also think you can see there was a great peak in 2014. Some of you might be wondering, you know, when was that? As I was saying to you before, that was a particularly large operations of personalized ransomware events. Um, and then you know, one of the questions of the MSR SIG is what can we do working with network providers, uh, working with uh, incident responders, um, working with financial analysts and cryptocurrency transaction chasers and law enforcement to reduce some of the frequency of this, particularly of the ransoms paid, even if we can't necessarily reduce the number of infections. Um, so. Once again, this is the variation in price that you get per family. So um, how much you end up paying in a ransom or paying in terms of losses due to a ransom and especially not paying the ransom. Um, th these are the fluctuation in values uh, depending on the individual gangs. So which group you get hit by has a huge impact on the damage done to your organization and um, how you deal with it. Okay, <clears throat> so this is uh, taking uh, not an individual corporate view, but a kind of uh, maximal market view. This is a probability exceedance curve. So this is the probability that your ransom exceeds a certain amount. And you can see that you know most ransoms are 10 to the five US dollars, by the way, I've converted um, from Bitcoin price on a daily basis. Uh, so most of them uh, are below 10 to the five, and then some of them are above 10 to the six and so on up to 10 to the nine. So you can see an exceptional amount of um, huge losses 
uh, you know, or a very small number of losses are that large, but they do exist. And so um, what I'm trying to tell you there is, you know, the biggest customers in the world really, really fuel uh, biggest organizations in the world that are hit by ransomware really fuel the rest of the industry for these smaller ransoms. Although in the early days, you know, this smaller stuff um, helped organize these different groups. And now you have affiliates moving from one, one gang to another and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, this is the probability that you would pay a ransom above a certain size, right? Um, we wrote a paper on the averages and why averages don't really characterize ransomware particularly well, the ransoms anyway. Um, and, you know, giving an, an everyday explanation without getting too deep into the maths. Um, imagine that we took all of our salaries and we averaged them together. It might say something about our salaries and about who we are and, and how much we earn. But if we suddenly add Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg into our list and we average all our salaries again, the average no longer says anything about Bezos and Zuckerberg or about the rest of us because the average would jump so high. Just adding those single data point of Jeff Bezos or a single data point of Mark Zuckerberg makes the entire uh, sample uh, size uh, shift the average. So we much prefer if you use the medians rather than the averages, um, at least publish both because it gives us a chance to start to study if there are heavy tails in play. What do I mean by heavy tails? I mean some of the extreme distributions um, when we do the distribution fitting of these different ransoms. Um, long story short, a lot of money is being made by these groups and a lot of damage is being done to society. So giving you some perspective on how the frequency and severity has changed over the year, this is a, a cumulative sum of the count of paying victims. And as you can see, the number of paying victims is severely decreased over the years, um, largely due, I think, to you know antivirus, um, endpoint protection, uh, even WAFs to some degree. A lot of these things have made a difference in reducing the frequency of ransomware. Um, and 2014 was really that peak of uh, individual uh, payments. But if we flip this from the count of paying victims to the number of dollars made, you can see that we're living in the, the worst era of severity. So while frequency has gone down, severity has gone up. So the biggest corporations in the world are targets. Some of the biggest networks in the world are targets. Um, and that can have a huge impact. And whenever availability is threatened, people have a tendency to just panic and start paying ransoms, which is the opposite of uh, what we would like. Um, a lot of you know, networking uh, aids and assists ransomware in a variety of ways, command and control servers, um, emails uh, from, you know, uh, there's, there was a pattern for a while of using anonymous email servers to negotiate and, and um, discuss ransoms. There are things that can be done about some of that or um, looking at some of the C2 infrastructure of ransomware on different networks to help make an impact on uh, global ransomware, which is sort of why I'm here speaking to you today. Um, and that's essentially all of my slides for you. I know it didn't contain a lot of financial networks or, or um, computer networks. Uh, so it's a little bit different than your usual APNIC presentation, but we wanted to get across the point that the, um, the MSR SIG over at first exist. If you'd like to work on ransomware and kind of change the landscape, uh, we'd also like you to remember that ransomware is a big deal and it costs a lot of money, deserves uh, similar attention to DDoS uh, for a variety of different reasons. If you're into networks, um, we have financial networks, we have malware networks, we have the uh, binary distance between malicious binaries. So you've got multiple networks. Uh, it's almost like a complex networks problem, um, ransomware uh, in the whole. So that's my presentation. Hopefully I haven't run over time. And if you have any questions, uh, fire them in. If you wanna get in touch with us, you can go to the first uh, MSR SIG page um, and get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, uh, for your excellent presentation. So any comment or questions? So or, and, uh, we can have a little time for uh, all three speakers uh, for uh, host all, all three speakers. Okay. Okay, so or after this session, uh, if you have any questions, please send to conference at apnic.net. And uh, we don't have time left. Let me conclude this session. Thank you, all three great.
great speakers. And uh, thank you all for joining Apricot Security Operations session. Thank you very much. So please do announcement, Mr. Free. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Takasan. Um, also, thank you, Tashi, for helping out chairing that session as well. And thank you to the three speakers, Marcin, Cherubin, and Aaron. Great presentations. Uh, really enjoyed listening to all three of them. And thank you so much for your contribution to Apricot. And so that brings us to the end of the security operations session. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation. And with the recording now stopped, uh, the conference poll has popped up in the screen in front of you. If you please fill that up and let us know what you thought of the session, that would be most appreciated. Um, so we have 14 minutes between now and the closing plenary. The closing plenary is on a different Zoom session. So please leave this one uh, once it completes and join the closing plenary Zoom session. You can access that through the program page as usual. Um, and we will see you there in round about, what does it say, 13 minutes time. So enjoy your short break and we'll see you shortly for the closing plenary. Thanks very much, everyone.